birthday last month. And some of you may not know that the sign for Scorpio is is twofold. One is as the scorpion, the snake underneath that n never lets go of a grudge. And then there's the phoenix who is perpetually reborn. So my t poem is titled Senescence to a Scorpio. Every year I marvel how I've never been this old before. Every year it's true. It is in fact amazing that I continue getting older without aging. Oh yes, the many teeth, absent, sight and, searing, sight and hearing have required expensive readjustment. But don't forget the MFA degree, age 74. Civil rights in 1961, before the masses climbed aboard a learning curve naively led by getting shot and ostracized. Decades later, best beloved friends were defined differently from my original white Anglo-Saxon Protestant home community. Origins were not important in LA. Hispanic, Chinese, black, Korean, Jewish didn't matter. Only how you were standing in your shoes. Getting older shows us up for who we always were, admitting sharp truths, sad misconceptions. Retrospective, always incomplete. The wise old phoenix soars above the earthbound scorpion, still invincible. Thank you.
again, I'm going to read you a poem from my book, Intimacy with the Wind, uh, right now. And um, I had trouble deciding what to read today, but especially after hearing Jane's song, I'm going to read a poem which is called Reasons November for Will. If summer, then motorcycle, four-stroke, bareheaded, then sun, then blare, then burn. Tiene sueños uno sombrero. If summer, then tomorrow wears shades, naranjas smiling in a bowl. Then Panama, then eyes open, then hope. If August, then Route 66, family selfie, all three squinting, grinning. If September, then college senior, hang out on the stoop, half empty bottle, acoustic guitar. If October, then floods, longed for rain, soaks the parched. If October, then Halloween, a lanky young man dressed as a bear. If Halloween, then Needle, then vain. If needle, why needle? If kidneys, if only. If November, then turn back time. Thank you. I think this is a poem about hiking. I love the fact that I, that there's snow on the ground. I just came back from a week in Portugal, and it was shirt sleeve weather there. So I came back and saw snow. And this is a poem about, it's a winter ghost story um, from about the White Mountains. I don't know if people know. The White Mountains were originally settled by farmers and such. And the farms failed, and they all moved west. And the lumber companies came in and bought up all the land really cheap and cut down all the trees in the White Mountains. Um, that happened in the, like the mid-1800s up to the early 1900s. When that stopped, um, they formed the White Mountain National Forest in 1918. But the lumber roads and railroads that they used, those pathways are still there, and those are now the hiking trails. And I used to do a lot of winter hiking, and this poem is inspired by some of that. It was years ago in the dead of winter when the wanderlust chose to strike. So we kissed our wives, bid our children goodbye, and headed north for a hike. As we started our journey, a storm formed around us. The wind began to blow. But we laughed at the weather as we shouldered our packs and headed off into the snow. We chose for our route an old railroad bed, a ghost from days long past, when, trees, when trains hauled out trees that were torn from the mountains by the men of the lumbering camps. The trains and the rails had long since vanished, but the way through the woods still remained. One final long scar, an insult unhealed, which the forest had not yet reclaimed. The tempest grew worse as the hours passed by and snow covered over the ground. From far up the valley, we could hear the storm growing and our hearts turned to ice at the sound. The howl of the wind rose along with the storm till it sounded like some kind of scream. Then out of the darkness, a bright light appeared. What we saw next, we couldn't believe. A steam locomotive belching cinders and smoke, was racing toward the spot where we stood. A lunatic must have had hold of the throttle. It was going as fast as it could. For a moment, we stood there, too frightened to move in the path of the hellish machine. Then its steam whistle shrieked, and we leapt to the side and looked back at the spot where we'd been. The engine roared past like an avalanche of iron as a lightning bolt lit up the night. The flash revealed a horrible scene till I die. I remember the sight. Just in back of the cab were men, locked in struggle. One of them pleaded and begged. His screams filled the night as the others held him down, and one of them sought out a sleigh. The surgery finished, the surgeon arose and hurled the limb from the train. It was coming right at us. We screamed and we ducked, and the forest was empty again. No sign of the engine, no sign of the men, no sign of the tracks or the light. We stood, numbed and dazed, then hitched up our packs and silently finished our hike. A fire was burning when we reached the shelter, and a man sat outside by the blaze. 
The fire, he said, was a gift from the lightning, and he poked with a stick at the flames. He nodded his head as we told him our story. Hank Slater, he said, was his name. On a night just like this, some 50 years past, he lost more than a leg on that train. He'd been out with his axe when the storm came upon him, and the tree, tree he was cutting came down. The wind blew it sideways, and Hank tried to run, but it caught him as it crashed to the ground. His friends heard his cry and ran into the snow. They found him pinned under the tree. His leg had been crushed, but he still clung to life, and they rushed to set him free. The train and the doctor were both standing by when they carried Hank out of the woods. They wasted no time as they loaded him on and sped off as fast as they could. His condition got worse, and soon it was clear they'd never make it in time. The doc shook his head and said, sorry, Hank, that leg has to go or you'll die. Now, Hank, he went crazy when he heard the news. Just leave me the way that I am. If you can't save the leg, then don't bother with me. I won't live as half of a man. The surgeon ignored him and went to his work. In the end, though, he labored in vain. Despite all his efforts, he still couldn't save him. Hank died on the back of that train. A coffin was ready a couple days later. They lowered Hank into the ground. If you know where to look, you can see where he's buried, but his leg never was found. His story completed, the speaker turned silent and stared at the fire's dying light. We drifted to sleep on our beds in the shelter while he sat alone in the night. When the next morning came, our companion was gone, but the snow bore no trace of his track. We knew then that Hank was still there in the woods, and we wished him good luck as we passed. Now, some folks say that the woods are peaceful. That ain't necessarily so. There's pain and fear going back through the ages and many a wandering soul. Ghosts live in the mountains, so watch your step and close your tent up tight. Keep watch on the darkness just outside your fire. Ghosts live in the mountains tonight. Thank you. This was a sort of an autobiographical song. Uh, my parents sent me off to school. And, um, I was mischievous, bored. <laughs> And bright, bad combination. And I heard the term today, the suicide bridge. Well, the teachers used to think that when I got there, they got me in a class. Oh no, because I was known for asking why, and they didn't know why. From the time I was a little child I was born to be both meek and mild To share with those less fortunate than I I was sent to church and school To learn to play by all the rules but I was mostly known for asking why Our house had an open door Our table always room for more No friend or stranger was ever turned away Mama died and Dad died too The house was sold to someone new I pray it's still a haven to this day In the words of a wiser man Life's what happens when you've other plans Funny how life works out that way Life a simple tug of war Between good and evil does some God keep score Everything in thought and word and deed Righteous ones we often see who force their creeds on you and me, bend the earthly rules their knees. And often hear a pitch man call saying, just sign here, you can have it all. It comes with a lifetime written guarantee. Every time I turn my head, if 
smile to my dismay instead Nothing in this world is really free In the words of a wiser man Life's what happens when you've other plans Funny how life works out that way You find a love of the rarest kind Understand the test of time Kind of love you know Will always stay Then come creeping like the dawn the Angel band and one is gone The other left alone To make the way In the words of a wiser man Life's what happens when you've other plans Funny how life works out that way So for you, hear this song May your lives be full, your lives be long Love and laughter fill your every day Years fly past and you spend your youth Final breath, you'll find the truth Funny how life works out that way In the words of a wise man Life's what happens when you've other plans Funny how life works out that way It ain't funny but life works out that way Thank you so much. Mai Iseo, much like, like you all. Thanks. This is a guitar solo inspired by a Carol Peralt poem. to read bystanders from my book out of the water bystanders the truth was always there sitting in the darkness you knew it was there I saw you laughing at my pain 
you talked about the sun, the heat, and the lack of rains. Not about what mattered to a little girl afraid. Silence is not always golden. Sometimes peace is worth disturbing. Now, when you give me a smile, I'm never assured. Because I've gathered the truth that when the darkness falls, I'll be on my own. You'd never use your lips to speak against my pain. You'd avert your eyes, pretending not to see. When I <laughs> offer you a smile, no, it's just a gesture, and that you should take time to read in between the lines. Come gather round, people. Come run and admit that a cataclysm is coming. Ain't no shelter from the superstorm. Don't say you ain't been warned. Glaciers melt, waters rise. Building on stilts won't keep you dry. No lifeguard gonna hear your cries. If you can't afford a boat, better learn to float. Now don't go whining about pollution. That's a problem with a simple solution. Don't you think you ought to drink bottled water? Why stop there? Breathe bottled air. Come mothers and fathers, make a stand. Don't take the word of that businessman. You think he cares about our kids? For Earth's sake, listen to the scientists. Our Goldilocks planet pillaged for profit when it's all used up. No way off it. Too much carbon in the air. Weather gets weird. Too cold there, too hot here. Crops fail, know what I mean? Got a good recipe for Soylent Green? Here too dry, there too wet. Shrinking habitat. Species teetering on the brink. Who's the next to go extinct? Maybe us? Hey, that ain't cool. I don't want to end up as fossil fuel. <laughs> Come mothers and fathers, make a stand. Don't take the word of that charlatan. You think he cares about our kids? For Earth's sake, listen to the scientists. Our Goldilocks planet, pillaged for profit. When it's all used up, there's no way off it. A lucky few might leave in a rocket. But hey, deregulation works for me. Smog is a sign of prosperity. Inhale that fresh particulate matter. Get that old ecology data. Solar, windmills, that's for losers. Anyway, beggars can't be choosers. And we will be begging, make no mistake. For the climate, it's a changing. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Yeah, it's been a long time, at least 10 or 12 years, and it's really good to be back. And around that time, the poem I'm going to read I probably was written around that time when I was here. Um, I used to read in a lot of open mics in the uh, Worcester uh, area. And I had a friend uh, who's a poet named uh, Chris Mellon. And I'm not sure how it happened, but we sort of exchanged the poems. And we would um, read each other's poems at poetry events. And I remember the poem that I read of hers was called uh, New Year's, 1999. And the, po um, the poem that uh, she used to read of mine, I remember people used to come up to me and say, you know, she reads that poem much, so much better than you have ever did. <laughs> and so I, I, I sort of stopped reading it. But just recently, I decided to reclaim it. So um, it's called Not the King of Cats. Of all the photo opportunities my father failed to capture during my childhood, this is the one I think I would have treasured most. I am three years old and three feet tall and tower over my troops, a loyal army of 40-odd cats. 
Round and round the circular driveway we march, their tails as stiff and straight as the barrels of rifles slung over the shoulders of soldiers. With a bologna sandwich as my baton and a bellow cry of, hee, kitty, 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 <coughs> they follow me, their ruler, their chief, not the king of cats, but their elected leader, El Presidente del Gato. As my Spanish-speaking kitten companions might have said, goose-stepping with feline feet, they arch their backs, rub their fur against the thin ribs of my corduroy pants, awaiting my command to confront the canine menace from up the street, or orders, perhaps, to storm the rat palace located in the cellar beneath the chicken coop and lay siege to the sinister kingdom of Rodentia. Thank you so much. Did you know there are other ways to reduce your pain besides taking medications? For example, mindfulness. I'm Dr. Mike Guidi, a family medicine doctor based in Essex County. I use mindfulness techniques with my own patients during office visits, and I'm here to tell you how you can prevent addiction. It is a way to train your brain to manage pain. Reducing your pain through mindfulness could mean you need less medication or a safer type of medication. It can also help you reduce your stress and recover from past trauma. That means you become less likely to develop an addiction, whether opioids, alcohol, or any other substance. In brain research, we scan people's brains before they start practicing mindfulness and after they've been practicing it daily for eight weeks. We see actual changes in the way their brains are wired. We see those people drawing more on their judgment and reasoning skills, resulting in safer behaviors. Massachusetts has great resources about effective mindfulness techniques. To find out more, go to massmed.org.